ancient African DNA. There's a, an interesting article that just came out in uh, uh, some of the science reviews that are uh, being made. Uh, the title of this particular one is called DNA from Child Burials Reveals Profoundly Different Human a Landscape in Ancient Africa. And the first thing to perk uh, my attention was that they're actually getting DNA in ancient Africa. Uh, the article is by Jan Gibbons and it's uh, relatively recent, January 22 of this year. Um, and again, this is available on the internet if you want it. Um, the uh, title is, uh, the, pardon me, the uh, article begins, Central Africa is too hot and humid for ancient DNA to survive. And that's certainly what everybody uh, that I know of thought. Apparently the researchers did too. But now the bones of four children buried thousands of years ago in a rock shelter in the grasslands of Cameroon have yielded enough DNA for scientists to analyze. It's the first ancient DNA from humans in the region, and as the team reports today in Nature, it holds multiple surprises. For one, the area today is the homeland of Bantu speakers, the majority group in Western and Central Africa. But the children turned out to be mostly closely related to hunter-gatherers such as the Baka and Aka, groups traditionally known as pygmies, who today live at least 500 kilometers away in the rainforests of central, Western Central Africa. In the supposed cradle of Bantu languages and therefore Bantu people, these people are basically pygmy hunter-gatherers, said Louis uh, Quintana Mercy, a population, I guess that's U.S., uh, a population <laughs> geneticist at the Pasteur Institute and CRNS, the French National News Agency, which was not part of the new study. So this is an independent commentary. He and others have long suspected that these groups had a larger range before the Bantu population exploded 3,000 years ago. <clears throat> the second big surprise came when the team compared the children's DNA to other genetic data from Africa and found hints that the Baka, Aka, and other Central African hunter-gatherers belong to one of the most ancient lineages of modern humans with roots going back 250,000 years. Uh, which is interesting, that's about the age of mitochondrial Eve, uh, officially. Um, in the new study, geneticists and archaeologists took samples from the DNA-rich inner ear bones of the four children who were buried 3,000 and 8,000 years ago at the famous archaeological site of Shimlaka. The researchers were able to sequence high-quality full genomes from two of the children and partial genomes from the other two. Comparing the sequences of those living Africans, they found that the four children were distant cousins and that, and some even more closely related, and that all had inherited about one-third of their DNA from ancestors most closely related to the hunter-gatherers of Western Central Africa. Another two-thirds of children's DNA came from an ancient basal source in West Africa, including some from a long-lost ghost population of modern humans that we didn't know about before. Now, exactly how you figure that out, um, ask the, some interesting questions of how they know. But uh, the, that's what the population uh, geneticist David Reich of Harvard University, leader of the study, said. The discovery underscores the diversity of African groups that inhabited the continent before the Bantus began to herd livestock in the grassy highlands of Western Central Africa. The Bantus made pottery and forged iron and their burgeoning populations rapidly displaced hunter-gatherers across Africa. The big knees lost out. I'm sorry, ignore that university. The team compared the children's DNA to ancient DNA extracted earlier from a 4,500-year-old individual from Moda Cave in Ethiopia and sequences from other ancient and living Africans using various statistical methods to sort out how they were all related, uh, which groups came first and when they split from one another. The team's bold new model 
pushes back Central African hunter-gatherers' origins to 2,000 to 2,500 years ago, not long after our species evolved. Thought we were six million years old, but whatever. Um, the model <coughs> suggests their lineage split from three other modern human lineages, one leading to the Khoisan hunter-gatherers in Southern Africa, one to East Africans, and one to a now extinct ghost population. An early diversification of the modern humans fits the great variation seen in fossils from of early Homo sapiens, says paleoanthropologist Katerina Har Harvati of the University of Tübingen, who's not part of this study. And um, I'm not reading the whole thing, uh, but just the parts that I think are most relevant to what we're looking at now. But others say that although the new study offers compelling new evidence, the data aren't yet solid enough to build a reliable model. So maybe they haven't got it all sorted out. A third key lesson from the study is that ancient DNA can be extracted from bones in Central Africa after all. The future is not as bleak for ancient DNA in these regions, says population geneticist Joshua Aki of Princeton University. Think about the implications of that. The article that they referred to is Lipson et al., uh, Ancient West African Foragers in the Context of African Population History. And uh, you can get the abstract available. Um, you can get the article itself, which I obviously did, if you have um, access to university uh, uh, material. Uh, and, uh, but, but for people who don't have that access, the abstract is definitely available. And the abstract starts out, our knowledge of ancient human population structure in Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly prior, prior to the advent of food production, meaning like farming and, and uh, I'd say ranching, but that's a little modern. Um, uh, agriculture in general, um, remains limited. Here we report genome-wide data, DNA data from four children, two of whom were buried approximately 8,000 years ago and two 3,000 years ago from Shum Lake, Cameroon, one of the earliest known archaeological sites within the probable homeland of the Bantu language group. One individual carried the deeply divergent Y chromosome haplotype A00, which today is found almost exclusively in the same region. However, the genome-wide ancestry profiles of all four individuals are most similar to those of present-day hunter-gatherers from Western Central Africa, which implies that the populations in Western Cameroon today, as well as speakers of Bantu languages from across the continent, are not descended substantially from the population represented by these four people. We infer an African-wide phylogeny that features widespread admixture and three prominent radiations, including one that gave rise to at least four major lineages deep in the history of modern humans. That's a lot to tell from DNA. And in case you're wondering exactly where these four people were found, it's that blue star that is right there. So it's kind of right in the corner of Africa. Uh, Nigeria is just north of that. Uh, Cameroon is the, is the uh, country that's uh, in there. And for those of you who are wondering, the Congo is here. And the equator runs right across there, which means that these things are like five degrees from the equator. That's how good they're getting with DNA recovery. <coughs> the deposits at Shum Lake, at Shum Laka, I guess, a rock shelter located in the grass field regions of Western Cameroon, are among the most important archaeological st uh, sources for the study of late Pleistocene and Holocene prehistory in Western Central Africa. The oldest human-occupied layers at the site date to about 30,000 calendar years before present. Uh, be present being taken as 1950, which is conventional for radiocarbon dating, by the way. 
Uh, but of special interest are artifacts and skeletons dating to between the end of the late, later Stone Age, about 8,000 before present, uh, that's calibrated, and the beginning of the Iron Age, about 2,500 before present. This transitional period, sometimes referred to as the Stone to Metal Age, featured a gradual appearance of new stone tools as well as pottery. Subsistence evidence in the rock shelter during the Stone to Metal Age points primarily to foraging, but with an increasing use of the fruits of Canarium Schweinfurtie that coincided with the development in material culture and served as a foundation for later agriculture. These cultural changes and their early appearances at Schumlake are particularly intriguing because during the Lake Holocene epoch, the area around the present-day border between Cameroon and Nigeria was probably the cradle of the Bantu language group and of populations whose descendants would spread across much of the southern half of Africa between about 3000 and 1500 BP, which if you're thinking about BC, that's 1000 to B BC to uh, 500 AD resulting in the vast range and diversity of Bantu languages today. A total of 18 human skeletons have been discovered at Shumlaka, comprising two distinct burial phases. We attempted to retrieve DNA from six Petrus bone samples. That's the densest part of the skull that's right around the uh, uh, inner ear and obtained working data from two individuals of the early stone to middle age and two of the late stone to middle age, about 8,000 and 3,000. Again, that's 6,000 BC and um, 1,000 BC, respectively. The two earlier individuals, a boy of four plus or minus one years, so um, uh, given the identifying code of two SE, one, lying on top of the lower limbs of an adolescent male of 15 plus or minus three years, denoted 2-3, pardon me, 2-SE-2, were recovered from a primary double burial. They're buried together. And the two later individuals, a boy of eight years and a girl of four years, um, denoted 4-A and 5-B, and were in adjacent primary single burials, but apparently a little higher stratigraphically. We extracted DNA from bone powder. Uh, the authenticity of the data was supported by a couple of things, but uh, one of the more interesting ones is the hetero heterozygosity for mitochondrial DNA. That is, if you find more um, mitochondrial DNA than you expect, you think maybe you've got some kind of problem con with contamination, whereas this is all pretty much pure. And for the X chromosome in males, since uh, males only should have one X chromosome, you should be able to uh, see how much contamination you have. And the estimated contamination is somewhere between 0 0.3 to 1.5%, which is pretty good. Individuals 2SE, uh, two and 4A, as a, that's where they got most of the stuff, as well as genome-wide data, about 598,000 single nucleotide polymorphisms for 63 individuals from five present-day Cameroonian populations. And we're going to see that breakdown of that a little bit later. So they check to see, you know, people living in that area, what kind of DNA do they have? and do they match these people? Uniparental markers and kinship analysis. All of the mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome haplogroups we observe at Shumlaka are associated today with sub-Saharan Africans. These were not Vikings who had made it down. The two earlier individuals carry a mitochondrial DNA haplotype L0A, specifically L0A2A1, which is widespread in Africa, and the two later individuals carry L1C, which is found among both farmers and hunter-gatherers in Central and West Africa.
Hunter-gatherers are, again, those are the pygmies. Individuals 2SE1 and 4A have Y chromosomes from macro haplogroup B, often found today in hunter-gatherers from Central Africa. Again, more pygmy Y chromosome. And 2SE2 has the rare Y chromosome haplogroup A00 which was discovered in 2013 and is present at appreciable frequencies only in Cameroon, in particular among the Mbo and Bangwa in the western part of the country. A00 is the oldest known branch of the modern human Y chromosome tree with a split of about 300,000 to 200,000 BP using conventional measurements from all other known lineages. At 1,666 positions, they differ between the uh, uh, present day A00 and all other Y chromosomes. The sequence of the Schumlake individual carries a non reference allele at a total of 1,521. So most of it, this person matches standard A00 translating to a within a 0, 0 split at about 30,000 to 25,000 BP, assuming uh, the standard mutation rate. Leveraging the effects of chromosomal segments that are, sh that are shared identical by descent, we computed rates of allele matching for each pair of individuals to infer degrees of relatedness. Both of the contemporaneous pairs display elevated levels of matching. 2SE1 and 2SE2 share alleles at the level of fourth degree relatives. Second cousins, something like that. And 4A and 5B at the level of second degree relatives, which is uncle and niece, aunt and nephew, depends on which, uh, or maybe half siblings. Supporting archaeological interpretations that during both burial phases, the rock shelter was used as a cemetery for extended families. So this is where we all bury our dead, especially the ones that die early and that we can bury where we want to as opposed to getting eaten by lions or something. We would expect more recent shared ancestry for the contemporary Aeneas pairs even if they were not closely relate, related, but we observe clear signatures of long IBD segments across the genome, which confirms their close family relatedness. All four individuals also have evidence of intra-individual IBD, and thus of recent inbreeding. So maybe the great-grandparents were the same on both sides of the family or something. <coughs> Um, PCA and allele sharing statistics. We visualize the genome-wide relationships between the Shumlaka individuals and diverse present-day and ancient Sub-Saharan Africans using principal component anal analysis. Initially, we computed axes using East and West Africans and hunter-gatherers from Southern Africa and Eastern Central Africa. So there's pygmies way down in the south, pygmies up in the middle of the rainforest. And they, and they check them out. The Sumlaka individuals project to the right of the present day West African populations and speakers of Bantu languages, hereafter Bantu speakers, and are closest to the present day hunter gatherers from Cameroon, Baka, Bakola, and Bezdan. There's apparently three different tribes at least. And the Central African Republic, also, uh, known as Aka or sometimes Bayaka. We then carried out a second PCA using only West and East Africans and Aka to compute the axes. And again, the Shumlaka individuals project in the direction of hunter-gatherers from Western Central Africa. By contrast, present-day groups from Western Cameroon who speak languages from the Niger-Congo family cluster tightly with other West Africans. In both plots, the two earlier Shumlaka individuals fall cl slightly closer to West and East Africans, but on the basis of their overall similarity, we grouped all four Shumlaka individuals together for most subsequent analysis. 
they're close enough to each other uh, that you can almost treat them as a unit. And there's some graphs that show that. Um, skipping on a little further, admixture graph analysis. Among modern humans, the deepest splitting branch is inferred to be the one that leads to Central African hunter-gatherers. Although four lineages diverge in a very short span, those that contribute to the primary ancestry to Central African hunter-gatherers, Southern African hunter-gatherers, which apparently are a whole different group uh, in that way, other modern human populations, which includes African modern populations, but also moving up to European and Asian. Um, and a ghost source that contributes a minority of the ancestry in West Africa and the motor individual. Although exactly how you differentiate, differentiate that ghost source from everything else is an interesting question. They're just different from everybody else, I guess. Um, Central African hunter-gatherers separate into Eastern, or Mbuti, Mbuti, and Western clags. The latter then branches into components uh, represented in Aka and Shumlaka individuals. Then, next, a, cl a second cluster of divergencies involves West Africans, two East African lineages, one associated with hunter-gatherers, another with agro-pastoralists, the more settled people, and non-Africans who are tentatively inferred to split close to the Moda individual but with no deep ghost ancestry. So they're trying to account for people outside of Africa uh, in this analysis. Within the West African clade we identify Yoruba and Mende as sister groups um, with Lemande as an outgroup and uh, most basically a separate lineage that contributed to the Shumlaka individuals, about 64%. Um, we can also obtain, well that of course means that there's some intermarriage here going on here. We can also obtain a good fit from the Shumlaka individuals in a less parsimonious alternative model using three components, replacing the basal West African source with a combination of ancestry from inside the clade defined by the other West African populations and from a source entirely outside of West African clade, near one lineage that contributes to Tafaralt individuals. So there's actually, there's a two component theory and there's a three component theory. Um, genetics and archeology span at Shumlaka. Our analysis showed that the four sample children from Shumlaka can be modeled as admixed within, with about 35% ancestry related to hunter-gatherers from Western Central Africa and about 65% from a basal West African source, or alternatively, as a mixture of ancestry related to hunter-gatherers plus two additional components, one from inside the clade of present West Africans, uh, and one that splits between East and West Africans. Now this sounds like they're 35% pygmy and 65% something else, and it's not clear exactly what the something else is. So you can kind of do what you want to with that, I guess. Um, although the scope of our sampling is limited to two individuals at either end of the stone to metal age, and maybe if we had more data, we'd have to change this. The observed genetic similarity across a span of almost 5,000 years. Think about that. Same genetics for 5,000 years. A similarity that is consistent with a skeletal morphometric analysis, in other words, they look the same too, suggests a long-term presence of related peoples who use the rock shelter for various activities, including burying their dead. 5,000 years, no change. However, most populations in Cameroon today are most, more closely related to other West Africans than to the group represented by these individuals. So the Bantu took over. Uh, in terms of physical genetics as well as everything else. Present day hunter-gatherers in Cameroon are, not, are also not descended substantially from this specific group. There's, this is a split as they lack the signal of best, uh, basal West African ancestry. They're apparently been separated from the West Africans longer. 
we do, not, we do observe elevated levels of allele sharing between the Shumlaka individuals and present day populations of the grass field regions, so the genetic discontinuity is not absolute. And exactly how that works is not totally clear because obviously the Shumlaka people could not have intermarried with present day Cameroon people. They would have to have intermarried with the ancestors, I guess. Implications for deep population therapy uh, uh, history, I'm going to leave that alone. Uh, methods, ancient DNA sample processing. So th this is one of the things I find interesting about the whole article. We obtain bone powder from the Shumlaka skeletons by drilling cochlear portions of Petrus bone samples. The same thing they did with the Canaanite uh, um, samples, by the way. Um, and uh, then, of course, the radiocarbon dates at the Pennsylvania State University Radiocarbon Laboratory. We generated direct radiocarbon dates via accelerator mass spectrometry for the four analyzed individuals using fragments of the same temporal bone portions that were sampled for ancient DNA, which means that they're relatively pure. We extracted and purified amino acids using a modified XAD process and assessed the sample quality using stable isotope analysis. I assume that's the carbon-13, carbon-12 ratio. And uh, carbon to nitrogen ratios for all four samples fell between 3 and 3.4, excuse me, well within the normal, nominal range of 2.9 to 3.6 that indicates good collagen preservation. So actually in the upper end from the looks of it, well, no, carbon to nitrogen, 3 point, uh, on the lower end of it, but still within the range that they consider good. The uh, PSU AMS dates were in good agreement with previously reported direct dates from different bones from individuals to SE2 which is 7,100, I thought it was 8,000. Well, actually what happens is that the uncalibrated is lower than the calibrated. Uh, so when you calibrate it, it goes up to 8,160 uh, to 7,790, somewhere in that range. Uh, and for A, which is 3,045, which calibrates to 3,300 to 3,000. But on the basis of a modestly aberrant date from a rib of individual, apparently they did a rib as well, and it didn't turn out as well. Um, from a rib of individual 2SE1, which is the four-year-old uh, oldest one, we restricted our finally reported results to the temporal bones. They're going to throw out the rib because it didn't agree with the temporal bones. Of course, that's an interesting comment because um, uh, this is an area where theoretically the radiocarbon uh, concentration in the atmosphere should be rapidly changing, specifically rising from a creation sta standpoint. And so uh, some difficulty with uh, ratios might be anticipated. We performed calibrations using OxCal version 4.3.2 with a mixture of Intercal and SKCal. They're telling you all the numbers that they're using, and it's a, uh, what it means is that if you want to, you can take those numbers and recalculate the dates just to see if they did their math correctly. Uh, and rounding the final results to the nearest 10 years. This is probably appropriate because they not really accurate beyond that. Present day data. We generated genome-wide SNP genotype data from 63 individuals from five present day Cameroonian populations on the human origins array. I got Ag Agam, Bafut, Bakoko, Bangwa, and Mbo. Uh, so they did, they gathered a number of people from different tribes and basically did their DNAs and Samples were collected with conformed consent. Everything has to be done. You know, you have to tell people what you're doing and why you're doing it. And they say, okay, yeah, I'll give you a saliva sample or 
blood sample or whatever. Um, it was approved by the Committee on Ethics and Human Research. So just a little kind of picture into some of the pain in the neck stuff that you have to do if you're conducting research. Now my take on all of this is it's a fascinating article. Partly because it makes it difficult to tell a simple story of tribes sticking to their own kin. These people are, are cross-breeding with a number of uh, different tribes. And partly because the researchers were able to resurrect DNA from 7,000 radiocarbon year old bone. Perhaps the DNA in human bone is like soft tissue in dinosaur bone. It just needs to be sought to be found. Think about the implications for that. 7,000 years in the tropics, doesn't matter. You can still get it. From a short age creationist perspective, the 7,000 or 8,000 year uh, calibrated year old bone is similar in age to the 3,300 year old bone and they both are 3,000 depending on you calibrated or uncalibrated. And they would both be similar in age to a 15,000 year old bone. Um, the best model I can find is uh, uh, to, to illustrate this is probably if you look at this, this is a carbon-14, and this is the concentration starting at the flood, going up, and reaching uh, uh, normal at about uh, 4, 000, uh, 450 BC, more or less. And uh, the percentage, the, the standard curve would go straight across here and then actually start rising, which is why uh, at 7,000 you're actually getting higher. But if you were to take those data and put them together, the uh, 3,300, more or less, 3,000, whatever, uh, would give you a number something like that, which would be, uh, and, and the 7,000 would give you something like that. And so the difference between them is, instead of being 5,000 years, it's gonna be less than 1,000. So it makes it a little easier to understand why the genome doesn't change that much for 1,000 years rather than 5,000. And of course, if you have 15,000, it would be even uh, more rapid. And it raises the interesting question, you know, if you can get 7,000-year-old DNA, why shouldn't you be able to get 15,000-year-old DNA if it really isn't 15,000 years? Somebody should look at this. From... Uh, this should make for some interesting hypothesis testing. This would also explain the observed genetic similarity across a span of almost 5,000 years. Well, if it's more like 1,000, yeah, yeah, be a little easier to swallow. Genetics probably will not prove anything one way or another because of the variables involved. It's not anywhere near like what carbon-14 dating might, uh, has the possibility of doing. But it might be expected to find, remar uh, to find remarkably similarity between older and younger individuals, uh, older in terms of radiocarbon age, and perhaps also between unrelated individuals of the same age. It'll be interesting to start looking at burials of all kinds of people. And if you can do it in Africa, why not in the New World, for example? Um, maybe Peking man, if we can ever find him again, uh, will yield his DNA secrets. The work will have to be carefully done, but the rewards might be well worth the effort. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Uh, they did some amino acid resumization res today, and what? Well, you know what happens to amino acid resumization. It barely racemized at all until we got to around uh, uh, four or five thousand years, and then suddenly it started racemizing greatly. I mean, you you saw an article on that, didn't you? What, what did they say? 
they didn't touch it. They didn't touch it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, I thought they, they, they collected samples for it. Well, they, they collected samples, but they just simply took the amino acids that they got and then, and then ran it through, and they didn't measure the uh, enantiomerization of them, or the, yeah, the racemization is not measured, so. Just think about it. What it means is, You know, if, if, for example, Australopithecus is thousands instead of millions of years old, one could do DNA analysis on it. Well, now, if DNA, and we would agree, I think, that survives uh, 4,000 years in the tropics. Yeah. Uh, we need to say why it would not survive 60 million years. Well, you know, somebody did DNA analysis of, of dinosaurs and they didn't like the results and so they, they got heavily criticized. Somebody actually did that. They got answers. They didn't like them. They were too similar? <laughs> <laughs> well, there was some of them that apparently were fairly similar to modern birds, and so that was... Do we have any good data on the rates of degeneration of DNA? We actually do. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think I present, presented that uh, several years ago, uh, where people had done MOAs that had been dated. And, uh, and they, the DNA degenerated with a fairly rapid half-life. Should it last 5,000 years in the tropics? <coughs> well, they're getting data that they believe. Uh, it, apparently, it depends on which bone you're using, and I think that's one of the things that, it, in other words, DNA in Petrus bone is a whole lot different from DNA in, uh, let's say, uh, finger bone. And I think that's one of the things you have to keep in mind. Uh, you can't just use any bone you want. Why should it last longer in one place uh, than the other? The traditional answer is it's denser bone. But we're getting this stuff all over the place now. We're getting it from here, but we're also getting it from the Canaanite burials in Sidon. And I think one of the things people have kind of forgotten about is that Sidon is not exactly cool country. And the fact that they were getting mm -hmm. DNA enough to where they could say that this is the same population as modern Lebanese, mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, which historically makes sense, um, mm -hmm. I think raises the interesting question of whether, there, whether this can be applied further and further back and it's just a matter of who wants to look for it. You know, we traditionally say, what is it? We double chemical reactions every 10 degrees centigrade. We raise the temperature. Right. Um, right. Does that apply to DNA degeneration? In general, I think so. I think so. Uh, so it makes a huge difference how, of course, to be fair, this may be in the highlands of Cameroon, which is, you know, maybe uh, 3,000 feet or something like that. Um, so uh, it may be that it's not quite as warm as the, as the tropical jungle, but uh, it, it, it will be interesting for people to start exploring, you know, can you get those kinds of numbers out of, uh, 
let's say, things along the banks of the Zambezi River or something, you know? Uh, I guess the, the point I would make is that it may, if you're careful, it may be easier to get data than traditionally we have thought. And if we do get the data, it will be fascinating to see what the explanation is. I'm beginning to wonder if uh, there weren't some people at some point that uh, perhaps got into a high mutation area, ate the wrong plant, uh, were too close to some kind of radioactive um, uh, uh, you know, or something like that, and and turns out that that their mutation rate went up because of it. Or perhaps early on there were uh, people who were having babies as soon as they could, and which uh, which meant that uh, there was a faster turnover, and therefore more fixing of uh, mutations. You're not far from Gabon, there, where we've had spontaneous. Well, don't forget, Congo, uh, I think there's um, uh, uranium ore in some of those places, too. Yeah. So uh, it may be that you're looking at, uh, you know, people who wound up with more mutations than usual. And the, I mean, the assumption has always been made that mutations happen at a nice steady rate for everywhere. And of course, <coughs> even if uh, one makes that assumption to begin with, there's still the, the problem of the Poisson distribution and how, you know, the mutations start spreading out with time. Um, but perhaps with uh, different environments, one might see rather markedly different uh, uh, mutation rates, uh, which is one of the reasons why traditionally uh, biochemical dating has not been thought to be as good as uh, radiometric dating. And, you know, even in radiometric dating, you have problems of stuff moving in and out that you weren't expecting. I'll raise one further question. Uh, reference, you made reference to mutation rates uh, calibrated according to the standard and what they had there, two, three hundred thousand years, the dates and so on. What, how's that calibrated? Is it? It's usually calibrated on the basis of evolutionary change. Okay, so it's... And <coughs> when it's been measured, yeah. both in Y chromosome and in mitochondria, it turns out that it, it uh, mutates a little faster than expected. Um, and in the case of mitochondria, you can pull it down about 20 times as fast as uh, mutation rate and therefore 20 times as slow, uh, a, uh, or uh, 20 times as short a time period, which means that um, actually mitochondrial Eve was about 6,500 years ago, and that's in the literature, and of course, as the uh, as the paper would say, nobody believes that. But uh, I do. Maybe we should. <laughs> I I see we have mostly stunned silence here. <laughs> well. Uh, I, uh, I'll say further, uh, um, I'm a little amazed, uh, well, I, I'm a little suspicious of uh, their conclusions. Uh, it's, do they have enough samples there to really make uh, all the, I mean, uh, we, we can come out with so many suggestions from uh, one or two, uh, samples and uh, it makes uh, good for discussion for papers but uh, 
uh, is this going to endure? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, and there's only one way to find out, uh, get more data and reanalyze it. Uh, I think what they, the people who wrote the paper have taken the data that they have, they've done the best job they can with it, and then they have tried to say, well, if we believe these data 100%, which of course, probably not totally fair because there's 1% contamination, if we believe it 100% and you put it in and you crank the numbers, what percentage of these people come from West Africans, from, uh, from East Africans, from Central Pygmies, from Central modern uh, dominant Africans, from South Africans, South African Pygmies in particular, the Khoisan. And uh, they basically they cranked the numbers and said, here's, here's how it comes out. Mm -hmm. uh, if you get another piece of data, you may find out it's different. If we start getting ancient Bantu, we may find out that it's different as well. That there may be some genetic drift between ancient Bantu and modern Bantu. Uh, we are, you know, we are making assumptions that all Bantus are the same, which is probably not fair. We are making assumptions that all pygmies are the same, uh, which again is probably not fair. Um, and we may f very easily find out that some of the assumptions we're making are not fair. And uh, the fact that they have two models that can account for their data suggests that, well, maybe it doesn't come down to one model as being clearly the superior. And, you know, I'm glad they threw it in, um, but it means that what they're saying has to be taken with a certain amount of uh, salt. I, I appreciate their uh, candor in stating that they did not like the dates from ribs. Uh, it reminds me, uh, so they use the one that probably fit better with the rest of their data, which is good, sci good science to a certain extent. Yeah, yeah. It reminds me of... Uh, but whenever you, whenever you say that, one should never allow the, the conclusions to lose the little asterisk that should be next to them. Right, right. And... Uh, uh, you're never going to get out of paradigms if you don't look at the exceptions. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it reminds me of an um, incident. Uh, I've been several times out to uh, Anuitak Atoll, probably the, the deepest reef there is. And uh, some of the other workers, we were working on the reef. Uh, groups of us were working on the reef there. And, uh, uh, National Science Foundation money. They took a couple samples from the reef and uh, uh, carbon-14 dated them. And I, I was, of course, uh, interested. And, uh, about a year later, some of us went back there and there was some of the same group involved in repeat studies and so on. And I asked them about the uh, carbon-14 dating. And they said, well, we, we don't know if we got the samples mixed up or not because the lower sample gave us a younger date than the higher sample. This was carbon-14 dating. It's not good to use carbon-14 dating on carbonates. I mean, we, we all know how fluid carbonates are. But they, they tried it, and they gave them the reverse results they wanted. So uh, it would be interesting to see. Did the paper just kind of quietly not say anything about the... They, they didn't publish it. As I recall, they didn't publish it. Yeah. Uh, we have a comment down here. Uh, that's okay. We're we're getting you for posterity too. So, 
<laughs> a ongoing factor that I think is very important is the report you gave today was based on four individuals, as I That's understood correct. it. Were those the only individuals available, or were, was there were they cherry picking? I don't know the answer to that. Um, uh, the report that came out really did not say too much about the archaeological context and whether there were 50 burials and they just took four of them or whether there was, you know, five burials and they took four. I don't know. If it was the latter, then of course the, that's not that surprising. If if it's 50, then it, then the next question is why did they pick these four of out course. of the 50? And was it because they were the ones that had really good skeletons or was it because they tried a bunch of the other ones and it didn't work? Or what the answer is, and I don't know. So there's no information on what they did to initiate the study, choose the sample, uh, who they're studying, et cetera. Yeah. <clears throat> it, it sounds like they came across somebody else's uh, archaeological thing as kind of a, well, would you like to look at the genetics? Uh, yeah, we'd like to do that. And so they published it and they, did, they basically did the genetics but didn't really say, I mean, I read the article and I could not find where they said, oh, and this, is dig uh, this has been dug by a professor so-and-so and his group, you know. Well, what struck me when I was quickly looking over these articles that you sent was this was a burial ground that's what it sounds like, which if you just take that, it sounds like there were more than four burials. As a matter of fact, I think you can safely say that there were at least six burials because there's site two, uh, person one and two, and there's site four, and that has a person number and site five that has a person number. So presumably there was a site one and a site three, and if you leave one burial in one and one in three, that's kind of a minimum. And the fact that they're saying burial number one and two, uh, and the, uh, you know, kind of suggests that maybe there were more burials in some of the other areas. Well, somebody had designed, de designated it as a burial area. Yeah. For some reason. Which means that they had, they couldn't have had just these ones. So you know, it, it, from that perspective, yeah, I think you'd have to say it's at least a little cherry picked. We have no record of what happened to burial site one and burial site three. And I know that you don't start numbering with two. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so there's no, uh, no, there's no intimation of the ways and why particular individuals were selected to study. Do they, is, I mean, how does, how do we know that there weren't a number of others that were initially surveyed and decided, eh. Yeah, or how do we know that, let's say they drilled 10 skulls, and they were able to get two good DNAs and two partial DNAs out of 10. Um, that part of the article was a little disappointing uh, because I would like to have seen it. And at least I didn't read it on the way through when they were talking either in the, the setup or in the methods that, you know, we found this burial ground and uh, Here's, uh, uh, you know, 
Uh, now, I am told that there's a sub, uh, supplement somewhere that, that does lay out a burial ground. Um, <laughs> and maybe it's in the supplementary material, and I hadn't, didn't read all of that. So... Uh, well, isn't it a bit surprising that this made nature without that kind of qualification? No. <laughs> well, I, I think... Uh, <laughs> Fifteen years ago, it might have been. I, I think science has deteriorated since then. Oh. If, if you write and you wrap up what you're doing, uh, the idea of laying out the evidence and then kind of collecting the threads and trying to make the best sense doesn't seem to be the way that articles are trending these days. I think the present trend is uh, supplementary material that is not peer-reviewed. It's, you just put in there everything you want to, and it's not looked at, and it's not considered part of the article. Which is interesting, because it should be. Then how do we know about that supplementary material? It, it's, it's there. You can get it. Oh, it, 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 it's right there. Uh, it's cited in the article, oh, but, yeah. but not evaluated. Exactly. At least in my case. <laughs> that, that article I give you. <laughs> yes. The peer review people go over the article itself, but they don't go over the supplementary material. Do anything you want to. It's considered the author just blabbing. Boy, those of us whose career was based on experimental data face a much tougher, seems like a much tougher, uh, set of criteria. Well, there's one other thing, and that is that I think articles are evaluated on the basis of how credible they are. And if they are credible, they get the standard kind of Passover. If they are, frankly, incredible, they might get rejected. If they are uh, pretty solid, but you can't believe what the what the uh, uh, what the conclusions are. They will be gone over with a fine tooth comb. People will say, "Did you really do this? Did you really do that? Um, where are your laboratory logs and everything?" Because they because I don't like your data. Because I don't like your conclusions. The. Uh this sounds disturbingly like the various uh, cable channels evaluating the current <laughs> political situation. <laughs> and they may be uh, worth as much. <laughs> In nature. I think, I think this is the procedure, and this guarantees the perpetuation of paradigms, whether they're right or wrong. It, uh, you're not you're going to progress as long as you keep up that you know, kind of attitude. Those, there are those of us who grew up with the idea that science was really getting onto something solid. And that... Well, it's more solid than most other stuff. Uh, well, it has been. I think, I think with time we may be starting to see a deterioration of the whole field. Which is kind of sad, and I mean it's happening in medicine. You know, somebody did a study on 53 uh, fundamental findings in in cancer research because they were trying to determine where to throw their three billion dollars, and so they wanted to be sure that the studies were solid. So they flat out reproduced them. Uh, more accurately, they didn't reproduce. All but six of them, and 53, that's 47, that's like, what, 80, 90 percent, something like? Uh, the, the Journal of Irreproducible Results should have gotten those <laughs> studies. You just preempted my next comment. I was going to say, aren't we lucky that the FDA doesn't approach it the same way? That's not what I heard you saying. <laughs> Well, the thing of it is, if it sounds good, you trust it. 
If it doesn't sound good, you look at its quintide. If you really don't trust it, you toss it out. You never print it in the first place. And, I mean, this is true all the time. If you think about it, you know, if people tell you that um, um, the caffeine is good for you, uh, we've done a study and we found that it was a good thing to, uh, to take. Well, people kind of, you know, ah, that sounds good. I like coffee. Why not? You know? Uh, if people tell you that um, tobacco is good for you anymore, then who financed that? Was that the American Tobacco Company or Association or something, you know? And, uh, and uh, you know, how good was their uh, method and everything? Um, interestingly enough, 100 years ago, it was the reverse. And you had people saying, well, tobacco, you know, helps bronchitis or whatever. I think our only rescue is to look at the data. Don't worry about the conclusion. The data is what's something we can still grab onto that's significant. Uh, Most of the time. Unless what Just, you are looking for is hidden. Yeah, be careful. You might find what you're looking for. <laughs> It's, it's a whole problem of, you know, how much do you trust science and which science? We're into some fascinating philosophical and uh, sometimes theological questions. Anyway. Come back next week if, if, if I am able to find the paper, because uh, unfortunately these science blurbs that they put out don't list the paper. I cannot believe it. They, they, there used to be a science news or something like that that did list the paper and always you know, referenced it so I could go find it. But, but in Science Magazine they have these little blurbs that they'll put out and they don't reference anything. I'm just, what? Anyway. <laughs>